Welcome back to It's Your Law. I'm George Curtis. Judge Bolt and I are talking about the tremendous impact of drugs and alcohol on tragedy, on crime, on families, uh, uh, accidents, divorces, loss of business, uh, loss of talent, uh, destruction of just about every part of the fabric of our society. And Judge, you've been an innovative judge which is a, a little bit uh, interesting because when you were new on the bench and you were just, uh, as the older judges would think, wet behind the ears, all of a sudden you go up there and start changing things. But one of the things you've taken a real leadership position regarding is the drug and alcohol court. Can you explain that to us? Sure. I actually started two programs since I've been on the bench. Uh, one is a drug court, one is a safe streets treatment option program. I'll do the safe street treatment option program first. It's a little bit shorter. Um, with drunk driving, which is a tremendous problem here in Wisconsin, the first time you can get treatment, mandate treatment, is on a fourth offense. And in my opinion, that is just way too late. Every other state around us, it's your first offense you can get mandate treatment. Now, we order treatment for a first, second, or third time offense, but if they don't do it, we take away the driver's license. What does that do? Three out of every ten people you come across when you go down the road does not have a driver's license. It does not keep them from driving. So I don't think that solves the problem. So what I did in the, this program is I got a pilot program started here in Winnebago County where we can put second and third time OWI offenders, are pretty well intoxicated, we can put them in a program where we mandate treatment and they get treatment. And so far we've had a tremendous success rate. Um, statistics have shown that with people who have as many prior crimes, the recidivism rate is closer to 50 percent, and in our program we're right around 15 percent recidivism rate, so um, we're doing really well in that program. And Mike Oleg from the county, he runs that, and our county board has funded that program. And it, we're saving, I think in the first two years, we've saved close to $500,000 for Winnebago County and jail costs because of that program. Second program started was the drug court. Um, as I was telling you, this is the 20th anniversary of drug courts throughout the United States. Started in uh, Miami 20 years ago, and that was the first one. Now we have around 2,500 of them throughout the United States. And it's a very intensive program. To be in the drug court program, you have to have a felony record. It has to be primarily related to a drug offense. It doesn't have to be dealing or anything like that. It could be writing a bad check because you're trying to get drug money, uh, burglarizing your neighbor, stealing their electronics, pawning them to get money. Then you have to have an addiction problem, and you have to be willing to be into this program. Get sentenced, put in the drug court, when you start in that drug court, it is intensive supervision. We were talking earlier about probation, seeing people four times a year. Well, in our program, they're meeting with one of our coordinators at least once a week. At the first 60 days, our phase one, they are tested, taking UAs. They're tested anywhere. They can be tested 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we test them to make them clean. And our graduates tell us one of the primary things that helped them stay clean were the tests, were the UA, because they knew we would be there. And you wouldn't believe the stories we get, George, from people that come up positive. Um, it is unbelievable. <laughs> they can play big league baseball. <laughs> oh, yeah, they can. There are all kinds of reasons. They kiss someone who smoked marijuana. Yeah. <laughs> there, are all, there are all kinds of stories. Um, but then uh, we make sure they're in treatment, they're in intensive treatment, their agents are going to visit them a couple times a week. It's very intensive, that first phase. We make them comply with what we coined the rule of 40. Every week they have to do 40 hours of something, 40 hours of work, treatment, coming to drug court, because they have to come to court once a week. Every Friday afternoon we have drug court. So they're continuing to come. So they go shoulder to shoulder with other people with similar problems, oh. which has got to help their resolve. And just this week, we on Friday, I was running drug court, and one of our people who were just in it two weeks um, had a relapse. And he came up and he started crying. He said, Judge, I can't do it. Throw me out of the program. I can't do it. And which was really neat for me is we had probably 25 other participants who were sitting in the gallery they all started chiming in. 
what are you talking about? You can do this. I thought that too. And they started giving their stories to this guy to help him. You know, you said you didn't have anyone to help you. We're all here. So that, for me, having those people step up meant a lot to me and made a lot to that person too. So now they're in jail this weekend thinking about whether or not they want to be in the program. And how are the families involved? Because they've got to be the biggest beneficiaries. <clears throat> Whenever we have a graduation, we invite the, usually the Chief Justice, she comes down or she'll do a webcast and members of the legislature come, um, family, friends, and whenever we have a graduation, after the ceremony's done, the family always comes up to me and thanks me that they have an opportunity to reconnect because when these people are in the abyss of drugs, they're not only victimizing themselves, they're victimizing their families and their kids, their mothers, their siblings. And once they become sober and they earn that respect, because the drug court's a year-long process, to get through it and be perfect, it'll take you one year. And during that time, you have to be sober. So these people who have been sober for three weeks in the last 20 years are sober now for a year. So they reconnect with their family, and their families are very grateful for that. Well, and the taxpayers should be grateful. We are paying so much money because people are angry when an intoxicated person injures my family, I'm going to be angry. Then I'm going to be angry at the judge who doesn't give them a maximum sentence. Even though if the judge does give a maximum sentence, I'll still be angry. That didn't do a thing for my family, that they did or didn't lock the other person up forever. We have gone at it with this old eye for an eye thing, which has just never worked. And I don't want to blame our friend Tommy, but uh, that certainly uh, was an expensive response to community anger of lock them up. We've got weak judges. We want to elect judges that are going to give maximum sentences, throw away the key, uh, not uh, let them out on probation in six weeks or six months because the jail is crowded. That reaction at that particular period of time has cost not only billions and billions of dollars and continues to have people locked up uh, for no real intelligent reason, because it's not dealing with the problem. Uh, but it has cost these people's lives. The lives have been wasted because we haven't, we haven't been treating the problem, have we? The, those are very difficult cases for judges, where you have someone for their first offense um, getting a homicide by intoxicated use. When people get three or four offenses, in fact, I, I help run the drunk driving victim impact panel from time to time. And one thing I say in the later group, which is people who have been there three, four times prior OWIs, I said, on behalf of the judiciary, thank you. And they all look at me like I'm nuts and say, thank you because now that you've had three or four offenses, you go out, you kill somebody, it makes it easier to throw you in prison for a very long time. And their faces kind of turn white. As I see this problem with alcohol and driving, the way we've looked at this was let's lock them up, let's throw them in prison, and we have proven that that just does not work. My goal is to get people early, get them treatment early, so I don't have to deal with homicide by intoxicated use. I don't want to have to deal with that case. If I can get people early on, first phases, get them treatment if they need the treatment um, so they don't come back, that's what I'm trying to do. And we've shown through like prison. Prison, it's $30,000 a year to house someone in prison. Right now in jail, I think it's $67 a day for someone to be in jail. Those, you and I are paying for that. Absolutely. Your viewers are paying for that. And we can send somebody to the UW Oshkosh to make something of their lives for $20,000 a year. It's pretty obvious where we ought to be spending our money. Treatment costs 68000 a year. Oh. Do the math. Absolutely. We're out of time, but this has been very useful. It's been useful to me because I read about it in little bits and pieces in the paper, but I never really understood exactly what you were doing and what the... Uh, I knew what you were trying to do, but I, I didn't understand it, and I'm sure some of our audience is in the same boat. Uh, keep working hard, uh, keep innovating, and uh, now maybe people will call you even more and write to you and say, hey, why don't you fix this? Yeah.